And so we're talking about uh, Jesus, the King of Heaven, the Fresh Prince, and how he turns some of our maybe conceptions about God or the Kingdom of God um, upside down. And so today from John chapter 9, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? That this man, or was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when we cannot work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that it was him. Others said, no, it's just his doppelganger. <laughs> it only looks like him, but he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. We will conclude our reading there. Today I want to talk about un the unorthodox Jesus. We talked about the unexpected Jesus. Uh, last week we talked about the unentitled Jesus. Today I want to talk about the unorthodox Jesus, and I don't mean unorthodox in terms of right doctrine, orthodoxy can speak to um, having a right set of theological beliefs. Though Jesus' haters and his uh, religious uh, opponents often accused him of heresy, I don't mean orthodoxy in terms of his theology. I mean orthodoxy in terms of his methodology. Not so much uh, what Jesus obviously believed and taught, but how he did it. Um, and I found that, that oftentimes God's method is not our method. God's method is not even necessarily his last method. God will, God will change the method so that you don't marry the method. Because we have a tendency to marry methods. We have a tendency when something works, when something helps us, when something helps somebody else, when somebody else experiences some good thing, we want to know how, and we end up marrying the method. So God has a tendency to do the same thing, but do it in a new way, to work his uh, always, ever, uh, uh, never changing uh, mission to seek and save the lost, to preach the gospel, all of these things. But his methodology oftentimes is different. And so today, um, I want to encourage us to be open to a new way, to be open to what God wants to do today. We're talking about the good old days, the 90s. If you're not careful, you start to try to remember maybe a previous season where God moved in your life. How do you ever try to recreate a moment? like a, a spiritual moment. I don't know what it was for you, depending on when, like, you know, but there was probably like, like it was this one worship song. Some of you, man, it was like oceans, you know? He calls me out and in around the great I know. And you're like, ooh, oceans just. And so whenever you really want to press in, you go, you know, you go to prayer closet, you put on oceans. And that's good to have your jam. I mean, whatever yours is, Maybe there's a hymn that you love or whatever it might be. Sometimes what we're really trying to do is we're trying to recreate a previous moment when God worked in a certain way. We'll try, to, we'll try to have revival the way they used to have revival, or we'll try to have a move of God the way they used to have a move of God, or even for ourselves to recreate something God did before. God doesn't change, but sometimes his methods do. And so I want to talk about the unorthodox methodology of Jesus as he works his miracles in our lives. Before we jump in, let's pray. Father, right now, we thank you that your word is life and light. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And so, God, uh, we pray for enough visibility and clarity to take one more step. We're not asking for the whole picture. Faith does not require perfect understanding. It doesn't require me to know the whole way. I just need to know enough to obey you one more time, to take one more 
step of faith. So give me clarity to know what it is and courage to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, 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 love this, I love this text. Jesus is walking with his disciples, and this phenomenal discipleship opportunity presents itself. Discipleship for Jesus most often happen within the context of everyday life. And so uh, oftentimes we talk about discipleship, and I want to be discipled, and what does it mean to be discipled? And I just don't feel like I'm being discipled. What does it mean to be discipled? Oftentimes we reduce discipleship to maybe a curriculum or a classroom or some kind of formula, formulaic kind of process of spiritual formation. But for Jesus, discipleship was far more uh, organic than that. And that's not to say that we shouldn't have Sunday school or small group curriculums or different things like that that we should not uh, tend to and and, um, should not give ourselves to in a desire to grow in our faith and to become more spiritually mature. But real discipleship for Jesus, it happened on the way to some other place. It happened just on the day-to-day journey. They would be on the way somewhere. Jesus might see a fig tree that had leaves but didn't have figs, and he would all of a sudden, like there, all of a sudden, this is gonna become a discipleship moment. Or you see a farmer who was farming, who was plowing the ground or planting seed. This becomes a discipleship moment. It should speak to us that God wants to speak to us apart from just on Sunday morning, that the only time that we're growing spiritually, that we're listening for God to speak to us is when the preacher's on the stage on a Sunday, then we are missing the opportunity to be led by the Spirit, to be grown in grace, to to, to really be formed into the image of Jesus, because this thing is a life thing. This is like every day, if you let him, God will be speaking to you and showing you things. And so they're just walking. They see a man who's blind. I don't know how they knew it, but they knew, they came to know that he had been born blind. And we knew that they knew it because they asked the question, who sinned? This first point I want to call motive. They're trying to get at the answer of the question why. And and in fact, some translations say, why was this man born blind? They are wrestling with, in some case, uh, in some way, they're wrestling with the problem of evil, which is human nature to do. When you see something difficult, when you see something tragic, when you see something uh, that seems like it it happened and and maybe it shouldn't have happened or it's regretful that it happened, you want to know why. Or in this case, who? Whose fault is it? That's what they're asking. Now, this is maybe strange to us, but in the ancient Near East, uh, in, in this time period, it was a common religious belief that any kind of significant physical handicap was the result of some kind of sin. Basically, it was karma. It was, it was you getting what you deserved. And you might have fooled other people, and people might not know what, what, uh, whatever it is you got going on, but God knows, and God got you. So you got away with it. You might not have got caught, but now you have this physical problem, or you got this issue in your body, or what, whatever it might be, and it is a reflection of some maybe unseen sin. It is, it is you getting your just desserts. And this is not a new kind of theological concept. We see it in the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible. We see Job's friends coming to comfort Job. And by comfort him, I mean they told him, listen, we know you've been sinning because nobody can go through as much trouble as you've been going through unless they've done something really bad to deserve it. And Job's like, no, I mean, you know, I I feel like I've been honoring God and trying to walk the right way. And and they're like, no, 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 no. Go ahead and confess what you did. And he said, no. And and there's this whole, I mean, uh, the lengthy uh, uh, monologues where the friends of Job are trying to explain to him that whatever bad's happening in his life, it has to be his fault. The disciples want to know whose fault. And, and in, the, in, the, in this religious context, they believe that even if a child was born with a certain handicap, that it was an indication, well, well th- like who could sin? Well, they believe that a mother carrying a child could sin and that sin create some kind of uh, handicap in the child or they even believed that a baby in utero, a, 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 a prenatal baby could actually like have, like commit a sin and then, and then be punished by having some kind of difficulty. I'm talking about the unorthodox Jesus because Jesus is about to, he's dropping into a religious system that believes that only good things happen to good people, only bad things happen to bad people. How many of you know that that's not the way the world works? The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. And so they want to know, they see a problem. They see darkness. This man is sitting in 
physical darkness. He's blind, and they want to know whose fault it is, and Jesus reframes the question. They are asking the wrong question, and and my concern is that I think some of us are still asking the wrong question. When we see darkness, when we see difficulty, when we see tragedy, when we see sin, when we see problems in society, that oftentimes our first question is, who's at fault? Our first tendency is to want to know who to blame. Where do I point the fingers? And we are living in a society and a culture where we have become, we've become professionals at the blame game. Everybody, whenever there's a mess, whenever something goes down, whenever there's a problem, whenever there, there whatever it may be, if it's the pandemic, if it's some geopolitical uh, situation, whatever it is, the very first inclination is to begin to try to figure out whose fault is it and to lay blame. Jesus, though, redirects his disciples. Um, They want to know whose fault. Did did he deserve it? Motives, because the truth is, if I feel like you can deserve it, that you deserve what you got, then I can keep walking. If I'm convinced that the guy at the corner, you know, down on Blanding Boulevard, if I'm convinced that he kind of, you know, made, he's just laying in the bed that he made for himself. He's, he's just reaping the harvest of the seeds that he's sown. He, he kind of, well, maybe he's just lazy or maybe he just made bad decisions or maybe like the, who, whose fault is it? And Jesus said, when you see need, your question's not whose fault is it? Your question is, how can I make a difference? This is what he says. He says, this happens so that the works of God can be manifest, can be brought to light in his life. We must do the works of him who sent me. God wants to work in this situation. This is not, this is an opportunity. You're looking at this and wanting to know who do we blame? Who do we point a finger at? Whose fault is it? And I'm saying, don't worry about whose fault is it. Think about whose responsibility is it? And it can be our responsibility, even if it's not our fault. If you're, if you're a follower of Jesus, the, there's a, the Bible says a, a, a poor man named Lazarus was laid at a rich man's gate. And it was not the rich man's fault that the, that the man Lazarus was poor and he was lame and he, and he had great need. It wasn't his fault, but it was his responsibility. He had access. He had awareness. He had ability. The Bible says one day that, Lazar, uh, that the rich man died and he lifted up his eyes in hell. Not because of some bad thing that he had done, not because it was his fault that Lazarus was, was, was lame and that he was poor, but because it was his responsibility to do something about it. Stop. I, I'm just telling you, the church, it's time for the church to stop trying to figure out whose fault it is and start asking the question, how can we help? Jesus goes on to say, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Well, newsflash, Jesus isn't in the world anymore. He ascended back to the Father. He's at the right hand of the Father where he ever lives to make intercession for us. But before he went, he switches it up and he tells his disciples, the very disciples that he said, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Then he tells his disciples before he leaves, now you are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In these two verses, he says, he says, Uh, This happened so that the works of God could be done in his life. We must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Three times, two verses, three times. Work, work, work. That it's the church's responsibility not to sit back and point fingers, but rather to roll up their sleeves and to do something about it. I'm just telling you, church, it's time for us to stop blaming and stop accusing and stop being a part of of the narrative in society where everybody's trying to figure out whose fault it is, whose fault the problem is, whose fault the darkness is. Listen, we can sit around and talk about how dark the room is, but is it the room's fault that it's dark or is it the lamp's fault that it's not on? Because we are the light of the world. Oh, the world is dark. Well, whose fault is that? If the church is the light of the world, if the world is dark, then the church bears responsibility for not all darkness is, is the absence of light. All the darkness is, is the absence of the people of God doing the will of God in the world. All this darkness is, is that many of us, we spend more time pointing fingers, laying blame, trying to figure out who's at fault than we do rolling up our sleeves and saying, we have to do work. We have opportunity. And if darkness is an opportunity for the light to make a difference, then we have more opportunity than we've ever had. 
You can look at this world and you can be depressed or you can look at this world and say, you know what? We have an amazing opportunity. You know what? This blind man right here, this is an opportunity for the works of God to be brought to light and displayed in his life. You know what? This generation and all the mess around us is an opportunity for the people of God to be the light of the world and, sh and shine the light. Like we're about to flip the switch on this thing so people can see the goodness of God. Motive. So Jesus said, we got to do work. And he's about to do work. He's just not about to do work the way they thought he was going to do work. Let's talk about method. From motive to method. From why to how. Because the how in this text is, of course, intriguing. Jesus says we can't just, you're asking the wrong question. You're, you're arguing about who, who sinned and does he deserve it or does he not deserve it? Whose fault is it? And the truth is you should be busy trying to figure out what it is that God wants to do about this situation and partner with God. We must do. Notice Jesus incorporates and invites the, the disciples, not just I'm going to do the work of the father who sent me, but we must do the work of him who sent me. You are called to participate in this. And so he starts to work. And he starts working by spitting in the ground. He starts spitting and making this big old nasty mud pie. He takes the mud and he puts it all over the man's face. I'm convinced that um, a lot of us, if Jesus was our pastor, we would leave the church. Everybody thinks like, you know, you know, I got a problem with the church, but I don't got a problem with Jesus. No, you would have a problem with Jesus because Jesus sometimes would tell you stuff you didn't want to hear. A lot of times he would tell you stuff you didn't want to hear. Jesus often sometimes would be offensive. Um, not, not that he was rude or, or crude, but, but, but he oftentimes he, he ran against the grain. And Jesus sometimes would do things. His methodology would not be the way I want to be healed, but I want to be healed on my terms. I want God to work in my life, but I want God to work the way I think God should work. Can I just say, if God only works the way you think he should work, if, if you only let God work the way you think he should work, then he's not going to do a whole lot of work. The Bible says his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That God's work oftentimes happens outside of the bounds of our own understanding and imagination. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And we say that and celebrate that and we should. But for some of us, if we're honest, if God is able to do things beyond what we think, then we need to be willing to let God work in ways beyond what we think is appropriate, the way we think healing is going to happen. Sometimes we put God in the box, not just of what we think, but of what he's previously done. Again, we're married to the method. Jesus has healed people before in the gospel of John. He's never healed them like he's about to heal this man. He's healed people in various different ways. Uh, he, he's touched them. He's laid hands on them. He's healed them. He's spoken his word and he's healed them, but never before has he hawked up a loogie <laughs> to heal them. This miracle was going to be messy, and I find that a lot of miracles are. We want God to work, but what we fail to understand is that many times when God really begins to work, things get worse. <laughs> When God starts working, things get worse before they get better. I mean, it was already bad. He was blind and a beggar, and not just blind, but blind and a blind beggar in, again, the ancient uh, Near Eastern world, there weren't the kind of accommodations for people who had his disability that we may have today. He didn't have a he didn't have a service animal. He didn't have he didn't have a a, a home that had been built with his specific needs in mind. He he had nothing. He had no way to earn money. He was dependent on the the generosity and largess of the people who may be passers by to drop some coins into his bucket. He had to d depend on somebody to bring him there and somebody to take him back. He he. He, his life was pretty bad. It was bad, and then God got involved, and it got worse. Because it's bad to be blind, but it's real bad to be blind and to get spit on. <laughs> and to have a big old mud pie put in your face. I don't, if you, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but, but sometimes i found that when God starts working in my life, things don't get better right away. In fact, sometimes they get messier. Like I started coming to church. <laughs> got in a small group started praying, got on a team, I'm taking steps. And guess what? I was hoping for clarity and instead things just got more muddy. I was hoping, I was praying, God, I need you to do a miracle. But now all of a sudden things are messier. 
Now, all of a sudden, I was praying for God to do something on my, my, my marriage. I, I, needed, I knew I needed help. I, needed, I knew I needed something. And God gets involved. But when he gets involved, sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. So I'll just say this. If it got worse, don't quit when it got worse. It'd be, it'd be a shame to be blind and then let Jesus put mud all over your face and be like, you know what? I'm done right now. I got my facial. I'm finished. The miracle is just beginning. You're in the middle of a miracle. When you're in the middle of a mess, you're generally in the middle of a miracle. Come on, I don't know who needs to hear that and need to celebrate that. Because some of you right now are in the middle of a mess, but the middle of that mess is the middle of your miracle. It really is. Jesus comes and he makes mud. He makes mud by spitting in the dirt, the dirt that he was sitting in. Jesus started spitting where the man was sitting. Some of us don't receive a miracle because we don't like Jesus to spit where we sit. I don't mind, I don't mind, I don't mind the word of God as long as the word is generic, but when God starts getting a little too close to home, now wait a minute, Jesus, that's where I'm sitting. Wait a minute, preacher, that's where I'm living. But I found when God wants to move you from where you are, he starts spitting where you are. He starts spitting truth bombs. He starts spitting the word. He starts dropping and dripping his, his word. Uh, and it'll start engaging with your context and your situation. And, and all of a sudden it makes a mess. Jesus anoints him. That's what the word says. Literally, it says he anointed him with the mud, which is interesting. It's the only, only place in all the scriptures where it says that Jesus anointed anyone. But he anointed him with the mud. He anointed him from the dirt of his, of his circumstance. I'm convinced that your anointing is tied to where, to where you sit. It's, your, your anointing is tied to your adversity. Your anointing is tied to your, is to your issue. Your anointing is tied to the very thing that's held you down and held you back. and The very place that has defined you negatively. I, I know people who now in our church, now they, now they minister to people who are in jail because they used to be in jail. Or now they've got, they've got an anointing to help people go through something because that's where I used to sit. And he, he added his spirit to where I, to my situation. And all of a sudden my anointing comes from that. He anoints him and the Bible says, you know, he makes a mud and he puts it on the man's eyes. I'm talking about method. He does it differently. He'd never done it this way before. But here's what God doesn't want us to do. Now, go around to blind people and spit on them. Fortunately, the disciples, they, do, they don't fall into the trap of valuing method over message. Because, because they're going to come face to face with the blind man who's sitting outside the gate of the temple in Acts chapter 3 after Jesus had left, a blind, another blind beggar. And the temptation is trying to recreate a previous moment, recreate a previous methodology, do what Je well, this is what Jesus did. <laughs> no, they reached out their hand and they said, silver and gold have we not, but such as we have give we unto thee. And they picked them up in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I, I'm just saying God will, the same works that he did, he said he wants to do through you, but he won't always do them the same way through you. Don't marry the method. Marry the man, not the method. Marry, marry, marry the man, not the method. Marry Jesus. Fall in love with God, not the way God used to do and how God worked. And so he puts it on his face. And then the Bible says in verse seven, that now he directs him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. All of this is unnecessary, by the way. Jesus could have healed him just by speaking. And instead, he begins this whole process, taking the blind man, throwing mud on his face, and then telling the blind man, go wash the mud off your face. You just put the mud on my face. Really, Jesus, this feels like you're just creating hoops for me to jump through. What I found, though, is that before God does something significant in your life, he gives you something to do before he does what he does. He gives you something yourself to do. Before God does the miracle, sometimes he'll give you the mundane. Before he opens blind eyes, he'll command you to go and wash. Before he heals the leprosy, he commands lepers to go and show themselves to the priest. Before he raises Lazarus from the dead, he commands people to move the stone out of the way. Every time God does a miracle, he invites you and me into the process. And sometimes we want to receive a miracle without participating in the miracle. But you will only receive a miracle to the extent you're willing to participate in the miracle. Now, you cannot do God's part, but God will not do your part. And he'll always give you a part. He'll give you an assignment. In this case, go and wash. Go and wash. And he later on says, so I went and washed and then I could see. The seeing part is up to God. The going part is up to me. I want to talk about movement. 
Let's talk about movement, because I think for every one of us, there's a miracle that we're waiting on, but sometimes we're waiting on a miracle when God's waiting on our movement. When God is waiting for us to take our next step, to do the thing that he sent us to do, called us to do, commanded us to do, that we're waiting on. And you have to understand, it seems like, God, you should do this miracle, and then I'll take this step. How many know that it's easier to walk when you can see? It's about a two-mile journey from what scholars tell us to the pool of Siloam, from where Jesus and this, was meeting this man, through the middle of a city. How I many you know certain, not, like navigating a crowded city roads as a blind man? This is not easy. It'd be a whole lot easier. Jesus, if you heal me, then I'll go. And Jesus said, if you'll go, then I'll. Some of us are waiting for God to move, but he's waiting for us to move. Some of us, he's waiting for us to obey. And oftentimes you're going to have to obey in the middle of uncertainty. You're going to have to go when you don't know. You're going to have to step when you can't see. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to move when, 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 when you're not sure about the way, when you don't even know if you can make it. I, I'm a blind man. I've, I've never had to walk down the street by myself before. I, I don't even know how he made it, to be honest. I have to think he, one, he had help, that he had people. I'm just telling you, on your path to, to receiving God's fullness for your life, you better have people who can help direct you to where God's called you to go. You better have people who can point you toward obedience. You better have people in your life, preferably people who have been there before. How do I get to Siloam? Go to the pool of Siloam. You're talking to a blind man. He's double blind. He's blind and he's got mud on his face. Big disgrace. Kicking his can all over the place. Where's Siloam? Somebody had to tell him, somebody who knew where it was. Some of us, the people around us, now listen, I'm sure he had friends back home. I'm sure he had friends. It was generally in those times, there would be designated areas where uh, people with handicaps would be placed to beg for assistance. So he likely had other handicapped people around him. Many times we'll end up forming bonds based on our issue. So I, I'm connected with you because we both got the same problem. <laughs> The problem is I'm identifying with my problem instead, with his pro instead of with his promise. And so you better get some people who are connected, not just to where you've been, but to where you're going, who can help me. I don't know the way. I, should I go straight or should I turn left? Or should, somebody who can tell you, hey, make a turn here. Somebody who say, hey, hey, watch out for this here. Somebody who can encourage you, just keep on going. You're on the right path. Don't stop now. You better get some people in your life who know how to get to the well, who know how to get to Jesus, who know how to help you walk in obedience obedience to the word of God. Come on, do the people around you point you to obedience? Or do they let you know how foolish it seems? Walking through town as a blind man going mud on your face, spit dripping all over your face, looking ridiculous. See, before God does the impossible, he'll often call you to do the impractical. And if you don't have people around, of, of faith around you, they will talk you out of the impractical thing God's calling you to do. Because it don't make sense. It's not naturally understood. It, it, this, is, this doesn't seem like it's a good idea. And yet God has called him to do this. You need people around you who even, hey, it might not make sense, but if God called you to do it, you do it. Hey, it might, it might be costly. It may be difficult. It may, it, it may be hard, but if God called you to do it, then, then do it. It might not make sense to serve. It might not make sense to give. It might not make sense to forgive those people who hurt you. It might not make sense you got to have people around you to point you in that direction. I know he had people, and I know he had perseverance. Because if a blind man was going to walk for two miles through the middle of a city, there's no way he did that without falling. There's no, I can't, I can't make it like to the refrigerator and then if the lights are off. With, I'm going I'm to find a piece of furniture <laughs> with my shin. Come on. How many times did he walk into a wall? How many times did he bump into a person? How many times did he trip over his own feet? How many times in two miles do you think he fell? And it's not recorded in scripture, but there's no way a blind man. Go, all, all, the scripture, all Jesus said was go and wash. And he said, so I went and washed. What he didn't say is how many times he fell in the process. You know why? Because how many times you fall in the process is not of significance. What is of significance is did you continue to go? Did you obey? Did you get up again? A righteous man falls seven times and rises again. You're not righteous because you didn't fall. You're righteous because you didn't stay down. 
When he finally got there, he didn't just have mud on his face. He had bl- bruises and blood on his body. He would have fallen down, gotten cut, got back up again. Hey, just stay down, buddy. You can beg right there. I can beg right here, but I, ha- I need to get healed over there. I can't, I can't get to where I'm going if I just stay where I'm at. I got to get up again. And, and sometimes people mean well. I mean, just, it don't take all that. Calm down. Calm down, Tim. You pretty, you're hollering too much. <laughs> Calm down. You praying too much. Calm down. You trying to serve too much. Calm down. You trying to do ministry too much. Calm down. You you're all, you're up at the church all the time. Calm down. You don't understand. You don't understand. I, I I could I could be calm. I was comfortable where I was. It wasn't good, but I was comfortable. It wasn't good, but I had gotten used to being blind. I knew how to be blind. I knew how to sit. In my, in my dirt. I knew how to sit on my corner. I knew how to beg. I knew how to do that. And some of you have gotten very accustomed to dealing with your issue. You've gotten accustomed to dealing with that addiction. You've gotten accustomed to dealing with that problem. The problem is God is not willing to leave you in that problem and he will call you out of your comfort zone. It's one of the best ways you know that you're growing in faith. Are you stumbling? I don't generally stumble when I walk now. There was a time when I was a baby, <laughs> a time in my kids' lives where you better hold their hands, they're going to fall. All the, the tables and the edges and the shit, you just, during that season, you kind of take all those things out of the way, try to baby-proof everything. Because they're in a season where they, they're, they're, they're trying something that they, they're not sure if they can do. I'm not in that season anymore. Walking is not enough for me now. Now if I'm going to grow, I can't just walk. Come on, I got to I got to go squat. I got to put weight on. I got to do something a little bit harder, a little bit heavier if I'm going to grow. And some of us, we have gotten used to just kind of living where we're living and doing what we're doing. One of the greatest uh, 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 telltale signs that God is at work in your life is if you're stumbling. Because just because you're sent doesn't mean you won't stumble. Just because Jesus said do it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Just because you're sent doesn't mean that along the way you're not going to end up bumped and bruised. Just because God ordained it doesn't mean that it's not going to be difficult and that you won't mess up along the way. I'm just as sent when I'm stumbled as I do when I walk. I'm no more. I'm, listen, I may be stumbling, but I'm still sent. I may be ble- bleeding, but I'm still anointed. I may be, I may be bumping into stuff. Excuse me. Sorry. I'm still sent. I'm still called. I'm still anointed. Don't judge me by my fall. Judge me by where I'm going. Come on, somebody. I know you may be down right now, but don't stay there. Get up and keep going. Movement matters. God gives him something to do. He gives him a journey to take. He gives him steps, next steps. If you haven't moved in a while spiritually, if you're still doing today what you did a month ago, a year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago spiritually, come on, it's time to get up and move. But I don't know if I can get there. I don't know if I can do that thing. I don't know if I can do Elevate College. I don't know if I can serve in ministry. I don't know if I can, if I can share the gospel with my neighbor. I don't know if I can. Yeah, that's part of the, that's part of the process. The faith to fail, the faith to fall, the faith to look like an idiot with mud on your face, your big disgrace. Everybody, the whole time you're walking through the town, they're saying, we will, we will rock you. <laughs> he like, it's not funny. I know what y'all doing. <laughs> but I'm going to be obedient. People don't understand, I'm going to be obedient. People around me might not get why I got to go where I got to go and do what I got to do, but I'm going to be obedient. He went to the pool and he washed. The mud, the mess came off and he could see. I used to always think that he got his miracle when he washed. But the Bible doesn't say that he was healed when he washed. It says he could see when he was washed. Maybe it was. Maybe it was the, the moment of washing where his eyes got supernaturally reconstructed. Whatever was broken. Or maybe 
it wasn't the moment when he washed that he was healed. It was just the moment that he washed that revealed a healing that had already happened. Because he got mud on his face, big disgrace. He, 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 whether his eyes can work or not, he can't see. So he washed and he could see. But maybe the healing didn't happen when the blinders came off. Maybe the healing happened on the way there. Because I hear, I hear the, the story of the lepers that came to Jesus and Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says, and as they went, they were healed. Not when they got there. Some of us think that it's going to happen when I arrive at the destination. What if healing happens along the way? What if every time I fall down, I get a little bit more healed? And every time I get back up, I, God's at work. And, and it may seem like it's up and down and it's, it's left and right. And it seems like I'm never getting there. But every next step I take, God is doing something. And maybe I can't tell yet, but at some point he's going to take the blinders off. And I'm going to be able to see that he was working all along. It would be a shame for you to stop moving when you're in the middle of a miracle. It would be a shame for you to let them, the taunts of people who are watching, we will, we will rock you. Mud in your face, big disgrace. You know what? I might have mud in my face, but I have a miracle in front of me. I might be a big disgrace, but I have a destiny that God has for me. And I'm not stopping. Stop here, man. You can just... just... I'm on the way somewhere. I'm in the middle of something. He washes and he can see. Needless to say, he's excited. Runs back home. Runs back to the place where he has spent his whole life as a blind man. Lived his whole life there. Had never seen it. What God wants to do is give you new eyes. You'll step into a situation you've been in for years. But you won't see it the same way. Yeah, you've been married to that same person. But if you really get changed, you'll see them different. Because at the end of the day, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. We filter it through ourselves. So when God changes me, he changes my perception of everything. He walks in and it's all new. It's all beautiful. He's so excited. He coming in there. Now they start arguing. Is that the, the guy who formerly, the beggar formerly known as Prince? The artist formerly known, is that the guy who formerly was begging? And some of them were like, yes, that is the artist formerly known as Prince. And some were like, no, that's just, that's just, he just looks like him. And finally he said, no, it's me. Because some people don't recognize you apart from your issue. The only way they knew to identify you is with your issue. They can't see past your issue. When they look at you, all they see is your divorce. When they look at you, all you, they see is your addiction. When they look at you, all they see is your bankruptcy. When they look at you, he's the blind beggar. They didn't really, so they look at me like, is that? I really don't recognize him because I only have space for him in my mind in this particular context. I put him in a box. And now all of a sudden, he's not there anymore. It's why sometimes people from your old life will have a difficult, difficulty accepting your new life in Christ. It's because they just, the only way they can see you is as, is that the beggar? I mean, that's what I used to do. That's not who I am. Is that the blind man? I mean, that's the thing I used to struggle with, but that's not who I am. He said, yeah, that was me. And so they asked the question. It's a question all of us would ask. How? How? How did, how'd you get, did you get some eye drops? Did you go, you go to Mexico for some experimental treatment? Or you, if you see somebody, you see, you see somebody you haven't seen in a while and they lost some weight, they're looking good, you'd be like, what'd you do? I want to know your secret. Like, what do you, you know? You see somebody, they gotten jacked up, you know, they, they, they look shredded. You'd be like, what you take, man? What you taking? What supplements you, going, you on? What you got? I want to know how. This part I want to call message, and I'm, I'm done. We're going to pray and get out of here. Message. Because God, God wants to work a miracle. One, because he loves you. 
and it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And, and a miracle is basically the kingdom of God breaking into the kingdom of the world. A, a miracle is heaven dripping onto earth. It's not, it's, not, it's not a miracle in heaven. In heaven, there is no death. There is no sickness. He wipes away every tear from every eye. In, in heaven, it is normal and normative. Here, it's out of the ordinary. It's, it's the kingdom of God coming to the earth. It's us getting a glimpse, a foretaste. It's an appetizer just to remind us that there's more coming. I say, how did you receive your sight? How did this happen? And I love his response. He said, the man they call Jesus. They asked how it's intriguing because at the beginning of the story, the disciples asked, who sinned? Who is at fault? They asked who. Jesus said, don't ask who. Ask how. How can we help? How can we make a difference? How can we display the grace and the love and the power of God in this situation, in this opportunity? Don't try to figure out whose fault it is. Try to figure out how can we display God's glory in this context? And now the story ends in a kind of recapitulation. They ask how, and he answers, who? How did it happen? Not how, but who? I believe God wants to do something so radical in your life, a transformation that is, uh, wants to create such contrast between the old you and the new you that it makes people want to know, bruh, I don't know. You need to tell me what's going on because the old you <laughs> was that guy. The artist formerly known as. The employee for, formerly known as. The husband formerly known as. The person who formerly was identified by this particular issue. And now they're so transformed that it makes everybody want to know how. But your answer is not how. Your answer is who. That the only, the only explanation, see, God wants to do something, I believe, so radical in your life that doctors don't get credit, and the counselors don't get credit, and the therapists don't get credit, and it's good, like, all those things. I mean, he went on to say, he made some mud, he spit, it was, it was nasty, but it's not about how he did it. Don't marry the method, marry the man. It's a man named Jesus. The only explanation I have for my life, for the transformation, for the hope that I have, for the joy that I, I'm going through hell, but I still have hope. I've been through hell, but I still got joy. How? A man named Jesus. When people know what you've been through when people know the journey they see the blood on your shins and the bruises on your leg they know how many times you fell and you still got up and now you're here standing redeemed and restored and healthy and whole how a man named Jesus that the only explanation for our lives for the grace in our lives and the goodness in our lives is not that we knew we had some special formula we got the right eye drops. We read the right book. We had the right 12 steps. I mean, do all those things. But ultimately, the only answer I have is I met this man named Jesus. And it changed everything. And I love it because then, they're, then they started asking. At first, they were like, what kind of drops you get? Where'd you get them? Where can I get? How, what, what's your doctor? And, and they were wanting to know how because they wanted some of the how. And he said, not how, but who. They said, then we want some of the who. Where is he? The, the best evangelism me method that we will ever have is transform lives. You can tell people all day long, you know the best way to bring people to Jesus? I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. God wants to turn you into a message. He wants to turn your mess into a miracle, into a message. Let's pray before we leave. Father, there are some of us who are in the middle of the mess. There is no miracle. And for us, maybe there's not even the expectation that there will be one. This blind man, no doubt, did not entertain the possibility of not being blind. He could not imagine a reality 
that was any different than every day that he had ever experienced. There are some of us who have resigned to our heartbreak, our darkness, our sin, our struggle. It's just my lot in life. It's just the way it's going to be. And then Jesus showed up and he dared to give him hope for something different. And not just hope, but a tangible step to take by faith. And maybe you're here today and, and maybe you haven't had hope, but maybe something right now is moving in your heart. And I believe that's the Holy Spirit. I believe that's the voice of the Lord. Because God loves you where you are, but he loves you way too much to leave you where you are, how you are. He wants to heal you, restore you, save you, redeem you. And if you're here and you just say, Tim, I need that. I know I need that. I can't get up on my own. I can't see on my own. I can't, I can't get out of this darkness on my own. I can't get out of this depression on my own. I can't get out of this sin issue that I've got by myself. I need help. If you want God's help today, if you want to be saved today, restored today, a new life today, come on, pray this in your heart while I pray it out loud. God, right now we thank you. We thank you, God, that while other people see our issues, you see your beloved son, your beloved daughter. You don't see what we did. You don't see our addiction. You don't see our past. You see who we are, and not just who we are, but who we can be. And I pray right now, God, you've been spitting where we're sitting. You've been speaking to us, and we hear you. And so we say yes. We're going to stand up by faith. We're going to move by faith. We're going to put our trust in you. Forgive us and wash us and cleanse us because of Jesus and his life and death and resurrection. We believe the cross mattered for us. We believe that just like the tomb is empty, God, we will too. We will rise up from everything that has held us down. All of the death that's been at work inside of us, we're delivered from it because Jesus has won the victory. And so today we get up by faith. Let today be the first day of a new life. Old things are passed away. Everything becomes new. The new me, you might not recognize me tomorrow because there's a new me. God, right now, would you do that? I need a new life. I need a new start. I need you to cleanse and wash and rebirth. In Jesus' name, we receive it. And God, for those of us who are already walking with Jesus, they're disciples of Jesus. Help us, God, when we see trouble, when we see darkness, when we see messes in the world around us, help us that our question is not, whose fault is it? Help us, God, that we're not trying to figure out who to point a finger at. We're not pointing fingers. We're rolling sleeves. And we're asking, God, how can we show your goodness in the middle of this situation? We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Come on, give him praise.